let's go live on YouTube. Fantastic, so we're live on YouTube. And then let's get the presentation back on the go. Esme is saying the snow was not thick enough. I mean, fair enough. You know, I think it's nice to have some snow rather than no snow, but you know, it's not quite enough snow to make, for example, an igloo or something like that, which would be very cool to make. Haley, you feel like a snowman should have a carrot, sticks and snow. Very cool. Esme, you had a snowball fight with your sister. I hope it was in good spirits and no one got upset, but it is very fun to throw some snow around, isn't it? Wow, Bowan said you made a two metre snowman. I imagine you'd need a step ladder to be able to make that. But well done, that's very cool. Right, we've had the poll going for almost two minutes and I think we could probably leave it there because uh, actually, you know what, let's leave it going for a little bit long. We've only had 55 votes and there isn't a second warm up question today. So let's just leave it going. And anyone that joins, feel free to answer the question. You win. that's a very good question. How do you join the new club? So for any of you that aren't aware, on Fridays at 4.30 from this coming Friday, we're going to be starting a new club and I'm very excited for it to start. It's our Friday club quiz. It's gonna be hosted by me and Jono. We're gonna be sharing different parts, which is very exciting. And it's gonna be looking at all of the things we've done in the week and a little bit of fun as well. Some fun questions here and there. There might even be some little things to look out for in certain presentations presentations. It is for any Nucleus subscriber, so if you already have access to the adaptive activities, then you'll also be able to come to this lesson. And the reason for that is that we're going to be talking about the activities that come after each lesson. So really good to be able to wrap up the week, have some fun, and really consolidate that learning as well. In terms of how you can access that, if you go onto Nucleus, you'll see that there's a section for clubs, and then on there, you'll see there's a specific tile which talks about the Friday Club quiz. And absolutely, we would love for anyone that can be there to come along. We've got two more minutes until two o'clock. And I don't want to get started early, just in case anyone does arrive bang on two o'clock. We wouldn't want them to miss any setup. But I am going to end the poll there, as it has been a very long time. 77% of you very confidently answering that in poetry, we might find rhyming couplets. Rhyming a very common characteristic of poetry. It could be rhyming couplets where the, the lines rhyme. It might be an A, B, A, B structure. It might be A, B, A, uh, sorry, it might be B, A, B, a, B, C, B. <laughs> I've just really confused myself there. That the second and fourth line would be rhyming. Lots of different ways that rhyming can take place in poetry. And indeed, you don't have to have rhyming in poetry. In free verse, for example, you wouldn't have any rhyming. But rhyming couplets would be found almost exclusively in poetry. You wouldn't expect to see them in any other forms of writing, certainly not novels, fiction, persuasive writing or drama. So well done. Let's share the results quickly so that you can see them. Let's move that back to the other screen. OK, so we are almost at two o'clock. And today we are talking about data. And some people might think that sounds very boring but I actually disagree. I think data can be incredibly interesting. And specifically, if it's data about things that you are interested in. While we're waiting for it to hit two o'clock, in fact, it has just hit, but if you know what data is, or if you think you've got a really good definition for data, post it in the Q&A, and I'll have a, a look through and see if anyone's got a really good description of what data is. And while I'm waiting for you to write out any uh, definitions there, I am going to introduce our co-trainer today. As it is two o'clock, we can get started. Our co-trainer is named Mila, and she is here to help with any questions that you may have. So if anything comes up, you can't see the presentation, you don't understand a question, anything at all, feel free to post that into the Q&A, and she will be more than happy to help. I'll be keeping an eye out as well. So we've got some good 
definitions here, some really simple definitions that are absolutely right. So well done, Regav, Haley, James, well done, Yusuf, well done, Annabelle, well done, Chaitan, well done, Darmendra. You can all see data is information. In its most simple form, data is information. It can be presented in lots of different ways. And we would, we would typically think about two forms of data and they're very long words. We could either think about qualitative data and that means data about qualities. Or we could think about quantitative data, which is data about quantities. Now we know quantity means the number of something. So quantitative data is the numbers for data. Qualities we know can mean known as characteristics. And so qualitative data is all about the characteristics of something. And actually we really value both types of data. In fact, pretty much everyone does. Everyone works with data in some kind of a way. So we're gonna be looking at data in three different ways in today's lesson. We're gonna think about interpreting data. So understanding what it means. We're going to think about representing data, understanding how to show it. And we're going to think about making predictions from data, which is all about trends and patterns. And certainly for those of you that are part of lunchtime logic and then doing any kind of reasoning skills, those make it, uh, that making prediction skill or pattern recognition is very important. So as I've kind of already discussed, data is everywhere. In fact, data is being collected right now. I can see there are 138 people in the lesson right now, and I am taking note of that. I love to see how many people are in every single lesson I run to see what that means. Are more people joining each time? Are fewer people joining each time? That's one example of data. At the end of today's lesson, I'll ask you to fill in a questionnaire, and that will provide some qualitative data about these lessons, and that will help me to make sure that these lessons are the best they can be. So data is everywhere. Data is simply numbers within context and can be used to identify patterns. I have also mentioned it could be qualitative data, which can be words and statements and phrases, but we're going to be looking at numerical data today. Data can, can be collected or recorded for things as simple as a class's favorite colors, all the way up to very detailed longitudinal studies. Now that's a word you may not have heard before, Longitudinal means over a long period. And so longitudinal studies might look at how things change over a lengthy time frame. It might be that longitudinal studies are done about how good education is and whether children are becoming more and more confident in education as years go on. And we can think about as a country how our education system is improving and the kind of provision that it has. So it can be really simple things or it can be incredibly detailed things as well. When we're thinking about data at the level we're going to look at it today, we're going to think about ways to interpret and manipulate a data set. So that's ways that we can move numbers around. And we're going to be thinking about averages. And we know that the different types of averages are mean, median, and mode. Mean average being the kind of very middle based on adding the data set together and dividing by the numbers. Median being the very middle point if you put the data in order and then start cutting things off each end to find the very middle point. And mean and median will not always be the same based on how the data set skews. Skew being whether it's kind of more important at the beginning of the data set or at the end, we'll think about that later. And mode average is simply the most common. So we look at the number that appears the most in that data set. We can think about range. So if we were thinking about, for example, the height of all of the children in one year four class, we think about the height of the shortest child and height of the tallest child. And the difference between those would be the range of the data. It's the kind of space that the data takes up. We can think about rates, patterns or trends, which are how the data is changing over time. And we can think about how we can make predictions from that, which we'll be coming to later. And we can also think about the order of the data, and that can help us to identify different things as well. But as you might be able to tell from the way I'm speaking about this, I find data to be really interesting. So 
we're going to have a look at a question. We're going to jump straight in and think about what does this data set mean and how can we work with it? So the poll is live. Give this question a go. So we can see that there's lots of information in this question. In fact, it's a very wordy question. So we can see Sophie wants to calculate how many hours she slept in one week. We've then got a paragraph that gives us lots of information about how much she has slept. And then it wants you to find out what, what formula can we use what operations do we need to use to work out that total? So you're gonna have 10 more seconds and then we're gonna start highlighting that key information. Okay, we hit the 100 vote mark, which I love. So here we go, we can see that Option A has received the most votes at 41, but option C with 29 and option B with 17 are both still getting a, a not insignificant number of votes. And isn't this interesting that I'm literally assessing the data that's provided by this poll within a data lesson? A little bit meta there. So we're going to think about how we can break this question down, because very often data will be presented in this kind of paragraph, very wordy nature. And we need to be able to kind of get rid of all of the irrelevant stuff, find the important information, and then work out what we need to do with it. That's how we interpret data. So Sophie wants to calculate how many hours she slept in one week. Simple. We know what we're trying to work out. She always tries to get eight hours every day. On Monday, Thursday, and Friday, so if you've got two hours more sleep. On Saturday, she slept for three extra hours. And on Sunday, she was feeling a little bit ill, poorly Sophie, but she got an extra five hours. So there's a lot of key information there. So we know that she tries to get eight hours every day and we're thinking about how much you would have slept in one week. This question relies on some of your underlying knowledge and all of you will know this, we need to know how many days there are in one week, which you definitely already know as seven. So we know that if she's trying to get eight hours every day and there are seven days in a week, then we need to do seven times eight to work out how many hours of sleep she tries to get every week. So we can do seven times eight. I need to remember to choose a thinner pen next time I'm annotating. So that's the first thing. And that would be if she's just getting the amount of sleep that she always tries to get. But we can see that there are lots of days, five of those days, where she got a different amount of sleep than usual. On Monday, Thursday and Friday, she got two hours more sleep. So for three days, she got two more hours. So we know that for three, we need an extra two on top of the eight that she would have got on those days. Then on Saturday, she got three extra hours. On Sunday, she got five extra hours. So we know that these individual parts are four pieces of information there. We need to work out each of them individually, and then we need to combine them. But actually, this question isn't asking us to find the specific answer. It's just getting us to find the formula. So we know that we just need to take all of those individual parts and just add them together. So we need to look carefully and see which of the options is seven times eight plus three times two plus three plus five. And as 41 of you correctly identified, that is option a. Now we're very close with some of these other ones, but option B has a times instead of a plus between three and five, and we don't want three times five. 
And in option D, we have a plus instead of a times between three and two, and we don't want that either. And option C is a little bit different to the rest. It's just getting you to find the numbers and add them together. And if you read the meaning of the question, it's very clear that we would not want to do that. Okay, let's reveal the answer as option A. Very well done. I hope that makes sense to you all. But we're now going to follow on this question. It's kind of the same thing that we're thinking about with a second part. She wants to now calculate how many hours she slept each night on average. Think about how you can do this. Uh, so I've just received a message from Mila that has mentioned that people are saying they can see each other's messages in the Q and A. And once again, I have seen this happen a few times. I'm going to have to have a look and see why this is not working properly on Zoom. But it should be set up that you can't see each other's messages. You can only see your own messages and the responses from either myself or Mila. Now, because we are already in the lesson and we can already see each other's messages, instead, we're going to have to demonstrate excellent respect for each other here. You need to treat this Q&A as if nobody else is, uh, is there. In fact, some of you are now saying you can only see your own messages, but it seems there's some inconsistency there. If you can see other children's messages, just ignore them. Don't respond to them. Just use the Q&A for your own use. It's really important that you are demonstrating that respect and not uh, not posting messages that might interrupt or upset others. And I trust you will all do that. OK, we've had the poll going for one minute and thirty nine, one, one minute forty. I'm going to stop it there with one hundred and three votes. We can see that more than half of you have selected option C. And well done. You're absolutely right. Whenever you see a question that is asking about the average, but doesn't specify which type of average, you should assume it means mean average, as that's the most common form. You may find some questions that specifically say, use the median average or find the mode of the data set. But in this question, it wants you to find the mean average. And if you don't know, we always use the same formula for mean average, which is we add up all of the data and then we divide that number by the, uh, the, number, of, of, or the number of pieces of information. In the context of this question, what that means is we use the formula that we worked out in the previous question to find the total number of hours slept. And then we divide by seven because there are seven pieces of information for how long Sophie slept. And it might not look like that with the formula that we're using, but that's because we are being very clever in the way that we calculate the total. If we were to actually think about the pieces of information, we can go to the previous question. Let's see if I can take us back. And we could actually work out the piece of data for each evening. We could see that Monday was eight hours plus two extra, so Monday would be 10. Wednesday is just eight because there's no extra information. Sorry, Tuesday would just be eight. Wednesday would just be eight. Thursday would be 10 because it's the eight plus the two. Friday would be 10, Saturday 11, and Sunday 13. So that's how we would think about each individual piece of data. But instead, we're using this formula to work out the total. And if you've worked it out, you would know that seven times eight is 56. Three times two is six and three and five are there. 56 plus six is 62 plus three is 65 plus five is 70. So we know that how many hours in total did Sophie sleep would be 70. And then following the formula for how we calculate mean average, we would take that number and we would divide it by the number of nights, which is seven. And we know that 70 divided 
by seven. A nice easy calculation for you, you're not gonna need your calculators for this, is 10. So well done to lots of you that found on average, Sophie slept 10 hours each night. That's how we can manipulate data to find an average. Okay, let's carry on. Another question where we're trying to work out some data. Let's launch the poll. And if you can answer the question nice and quickly, if you know how to do this, tell me who is this question about? Do you know who this person might be? Very good job, Haroon. You are aware of what this question is about. It's based on quite a famous film from quite a long time ago, I don't really know how long ago, called Wallace and Gromit, The Wrong Trousers. Okay, we're gonna have about 15 more seconds for this question. Think about how are you working this out? Okay, last few seconds, get your votes in if you can. Right, let's stop there. And so we can see that lots of you selecting option E. If you didn't select option E, we're gonna go through this and work out what the answer would be. We can see that Wallace, the inventor, builds 27 pairs of mechanical trousers every day. So those are two key pieces of information, 27 every day. It's then asking how many pairs of mechanical trousers can Wallace build in a non-leap year? And that's important, non-leap year. If he worked every day of the year. So just like that previous question about Sophie, we had to use our baseline knowledge of knowing that there are seven days in a week. We now need to use the same kind of knowledge to know that there are 365 days in a year. And we know that it would be 365 because it specifies non-leap year. Now, if that information wasn't there, if I scribble that out in a very messy fashion, if it just said a year, you'd probably still use 365. Only if it's specified that it is a leap year would you use 366, where we know that there is an extra day. But this one's nice, it specifies non-leap year, which we know is 365 days. So we know he's making 27 pairs of trousers every day for 365 days. And we know that we can work that out by multiplying. So we then need to use our long multiplication and we would eventually work out that 365 times 27 is 9,855. So well done if you worked that out. If you made a bit of an error in your calculation, just be careful with those steps. When we're looking at multiple digit numbers for multiplication, it's a little bit more challenging. Make sure to break it down, be careful with your calculations. Accuracy is important. But well done to lots of you getting question E correct. We're now going to think about representing data. So we've looked at questions where we're given a worded question and we're drawing information out of it. We're manipulating that data to find totals. But actually we won't always have data presented as a block of text. Sometimes it might be presented in different ways. And it can be presented in lots of different ways. It might just be a string of numbers, but it can be much easier if it's a table, a graph or a chart. So we can see here, for example, a class were all surveyed and asked what their favorite fruit is. 12 selected strawberries, eight selected bananas, five selected apples, and five selected grapes. So that is kind of like the questions we've looked at before, where the data is given to us in a kind of worded form. But we can take that information and we can represent it in a few different ways. 
we can represent it as a table. And this just shows fruit number. And it just clears away all of that irrelevant information. It might be nice for us to know that a class were all surveyed, but it's not that important. We just need the raw data. But that's kind of nice. It's useful to have it in a table. It's much easier to pick information out. But actually, showing it as a graph, and this is referred to as a pie chart, if you can imagine it like a pie with different pieces of different sizes, this is another representation of the data. And we can think the colors of each piece are matched to the, uh, the color of the fruit. So the red section of the pie chart is strawberry, the yellow section is banana, and then the green and purple sections are apple and grape respectively. And we see that there's a larger section for strawberry because more people selected it. There's a slightly bigger selection for banana than there is for apple and grape because there's more selections of banana. And then the sections for apple and grape are the same size because the number is the same as well. So data can be represented in different ways. We're going to think about this now. We're going to think about how we can draw information from data that is being represented like that. So have a look at this question. One thing you may find when looking at questions like this is when you are given a visual representation of data, which could be a pie chart like this, it could be a bar graph or a line graph, sometimes it might have a sentence underneath that says not to scale. And this is because sometimes that visual representation isn't perfectly accurate. The size of that piece of the pie chart may not be exactly the right size for the information. I'm going to have about 10 more seconds on this. One thing that you might need to note is the final sentence of the bold question. Give the answer in its simplest form. All right, we're going to stop there. And this is very interesting because we can see here that 50 of you have selected option B, 38 of you selecting option A. And what this tells me is that lots of you, 88 of you, are very confident with how to assess data that's been represented and how to draw information from it. But those 38 of you that selected option A didn't quite pay attention to that sentence. Give the answer in its simplest form. We can see here, I went for a lockdown walk in my closest park, made a note of the different dogs I saw. I then represented this information in a pie chart. We can see that the numbers are on the chart and it's labeled nicely with a key to show the different types of dogs. And so we can see there were 14 Lakeland Terriers. There were nine Chihuahuas, seven Pugs, seven Golden Retrievers and one Doberman. We now need to think about what fraction of the dogs were Lakeland Terriers. So we know that it was 14, but we also know that a fraction has to be a numerator and a denominator. It would need to be 14 out of something. And we always know that that denominator is the number that is the total options. And so we need to calculate the total number of dogs seen altogether. And seven plus seven is 14, plus 14 is 28, nine plus one is 10. So 28 plus 10 is 38. So we know that 14 were Lakeland Terriers out of a total 38. And we can see now why lots of you chose option A, because that's 14 out of 38. However, you must give your answer in its simplest form. And we know that fractions can be simplified, particularly if both of those numbers are even numbers, they can at the very least be divided by two. So we need to check and see what common multiples both of those numbers have. And in fact, 14 and 38 only have one common multiple, which is two. And so we divide them both by two and we are left with seven out of 19. Well done to 50 of you that selected the correct option there, which was option 
B. If you did select option A, well done. The data part of this question you did great in. Reading the question carefully is something you need to be very uh, focused on when answering these questions. Okay, another question. This time we're thinking about movie sales. Think about what this question is asking you. The final sentence gives you the question, but the other sentences give you the context for the data. What was the price of a single film for one of these genres? How could we work that out? I'm gonna give you a bit more time for this one because there are multiple steps to this. So the first thing we need to consider is this important classification here. That they want to know how much money they made on just five genres, animation, comedy, adventure, action, and musical. So there is irrelevant information in this question. It tells us that all of them sold for the same price. So we're not needing to worry about taking lots of information and finding averages or anything like that. We know that we just need to think about how much each film would be. It then gives us the information about the total sales being £540. So we know that £540 was made on those five different types. But we need to think about how many of each film were sold. I'm gonna give you 10 more seconds. Oh, lots of votes coming through, wow. Okay, let's stop there. We just hit the 100 mark, love it. So we're looking at these five different types of films, animation, action, comedy, adventure, and musical. And we can see that animation sold 28. Action sold 26. Comedy sold 13. And be careful with that one. It's between two numbers. So that would be 13. Adventure the same. Between two numbers sold 17. And then finally musical sold 24. We can then add those all together to find that the total number of films sold for those five genres was 100 and eight. So now we have all the information that we need. We know that 540 pounds was made on the sale of 108 films. And we know that all of those films sold for the same price. So we can simply do 540 divided by 108. And that is a bit of a tricky calculation, but one that you can do with your long division, taking it step by step. But another strategy when you're doing these big numbers is thinking about, well, what, what's my 108 times tables? You could put them out, 108, 216, 324, 432, so on and so forth. And eventually, we would find that 540 divided by 108 is five. And this shows us that the, uh, the price of a single film for one of these genres was option A, five pounds. Be very careful about that because I can see that actually three of the options got more votes than option A. So really think about how you can break these questions down. Worded problems always have a lot of different steps to get through. 
you have to think really carefully about what is being asked. But well done to those of you that did select option A. Right, let's get to the next slide. Turn off the annotations. Why is Zoom not letting me turn off the annotations? Come on, Zoom. Sorry about the delay, the pop-up has gone. Give me one moment. There we go, how peculiar. Right, well done to those of you that got option A. So this is gonna be our last representing data question. Think about what you learned from that previous question. Think about what this question might be asking you. I'm surprised that so many votes would have come in that quickly. I find it very hard to believe that you would know the answer that quickly. There should be no votes within the first 15 seconds, particularly with a question this detailed. Okay, so we've had one minute. We're going to have another minute to think about this question. Think about those key words. Every type of pasta except for spaghetti and tagliatelle has a three pound off deal. So we know that we don't need to think about spaghetti or tagliatelle. What was the total dis uh, discount given across all of the types of pasta with that special offer? So we know it was three pounds off. We can think about how many of each type of pasta was sold, how many bags, but we don't need tagliatelle or spaghetti. So we can then think, okay, so it's 12 and 15, because it's between the two lines, and 13 and 11 and 20. I'm gonna end the poll there. In fact, no, I'm gonna give you a moment longer. We can see how many of each bag was sold. We can add them together to see the total number of bags sold for those five types of pasta. And if we know that every single one of those bags had a three pound discount, what would the total discount have been across all of the types of pasta? Okay, 10 more seconds. Okay, let's stop there. We've had three minutes for that question. And this is certainly a question that takes a bit longer to break it down step by step. But we want to be aiming to really pick up that speed. Someone's mentioned before in, in one of my other lessons that we need to be aiming for about 30 seconds per question. Now, if I saw this question, I would never expect you to be able to do this in 30 seconds. We're thinking about an average of 30 seconds, which means some you're going to be able to answer much quickly. You might be able to do them in five or 10 seconds. If it was, what is three times four? You could do that like that. And that means that these questions can take a bit longer in aid of that 30 second average. So we've already thought about the key information. We've already read the bar graph and found the amount of bags of pasta sold for ravioli, penny, fusilli, macaroni, and farfalla. We can see the numbers and we can add them all together. And we know that 12 plus 15 plus 13 plus 11 plus 20 is 71. The reason that option D is put there as 71 is there's a little bit of a red herring because 71 bags of pasta were sold. 
But we need to know how much money has Lorenzo essentially lost out on through giving a three pound off deal. And there's 71 bags sold and each one has had three pounds off, which means we need to do 71 times three. And well done to the 38 of you that did select option C. 71 times three is 213 pounds. Despite the excellent sales that Lorenzo has made this week, he has actually lost out on that money for a discount. Maybe the discount helped to get more sales anyway. We're now going to think about making predictions. When we are looking at data, we can see we've got a line graph here. When it's represented visually, we can see patterns. We can see how the data is changing and we can make predictions based on that data. We can see that in this graph here, the temperature of an oven has been monitored over a period of five minutes. At the start, the oven was off and had a temperature of zero degrees. After one minute, the temperature went up to 20 degrees, two minutes, 40 degrees, three minutes, 60 degrees. And we can see that this line is showing a very strong pattern. Now, this is for the sake of example. Ovens heat up in a much more different way to this. But as an example, we can see that this is what we would call a linear progression. A line is showing how this is moving. But we can use this information to make predictions. We can continue this line and think about where it might be in the future. And so even though the data is not there, we can imagine based on the strength of this line, this is a very strong trend, that at the six minute mark, it's likely the oven would be 120 degrees. At the seven minute mark, it's likely to be 140 degrees and so on and so forth. This kind of information is incredibly useful for all kinds of different things, but making predictions can help you to make decisions. And particularly if you knew that the weather was getting better every day, you could plan for when you went on a nice walk. You can use data to make predictions. So let's have a look at some questions and think about how we can make predictions. So when we're looking at this graph, we want to think about over what period is the line changing? And how could we replicate that pattern to make a good prediction? I would always start off by looking at the smallest change, but something that makes it a bit trickier with this question is over that three day period, it's kind of difficult to tell where that dot actually is. I know that it's less than 10, but is it eight? Is it seven? Could it be six? It's difficult to tell with the scale of this graph. But if we look further ahead, we can look for the points where it's very nicely sat on lines. And we can see that here at the nine day mark, that dot is very nicely situated above the nine and along from 20. And if we then follow that pattern of every nine days, we can see here, once again, it's sitting above 18 and very nicely at 40. We're now trying to work out what will the pattern look like at day 27. And we could start by drawing a line. Let me see, does this let me do a line? Here we go. So we could draw a line like this, continue the pattern. And then if we read the graph, we can see that at day 27, the graph is sitting at 60. Ooh, so very well done to lots of you that did that very effectively. You were able to read the graph and make a prediction. 
For any of you unfamiliar with the name of the person in this uh, in this question, this is pronounced as Chami, and it is the name of a friend of mine who is Vietnamese. It's a very cool name. Okay, let's have a look at another question. So I mentioned before that when we see a graph that's got a very straight line, we would refer to that as a linear progression. That is when we know that it's making the same change over time. But we could also see a, uh, an exponential progression. And this would be referred, uh, this would be something that is not necessarily changing at the right step each time. Right, let's move, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Let's turn off the annotations. Why is Zoom being difficult today? There we go. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. Let's get the poll going as well. very confident answering so far. Well done. Think about what data you can see on the graph, what it means, and how it is changing. Not going to have too much longer on this one, maybe about five more seconds. Okay, let's wrap it up there. So this is an example of an exponential progression. And what this means is the number is doubling each time. In the previous question, it was increasing by 20 seconds, uh, sorry, 20 centimeters every nine days. And that's a linear progression. It's the same change over the same period. In this question, we can see that the number of people that Kim is selling cookies to is doubling every day. So on the Monday, it's one person. On the Tuesday, it's two. Wednesday, it's four. Thursday, it's eight. And if we continue that pattern, she could expect to sell cookies to 16 people on Friday. Very well done to those of you that spotted the pattern and worked out what the next number would be. So some of you selected option D, which was 10. And I put that in there intentionally because even though 10 is the top value on the graph, that does not mean that that's the limit of how far the data can go. If you were to, uh, if Kim was to sell to 16 people on Friday and she was to create another graph representing that data, she would simply change the graph so that it was going up to 16 or 20, you change the scale to better represent the data. Imagine if we had this graph, but we made it go up to 100, all of the information would be tiny on the graph. You would end up with the Thursday bar being so small that it would be very difficult to tell what the information is. So graphs are most often represented in a scale that best fits the data available. But that does not mean that the data can't exceed it. Very well done to those of you that selected option E. And that wraps up our lesson on data. Data is something that is incredibly important. And in fact, I heard something a few years ago that apparently data is now the most valuable commodity the most valuable thing that people can trade. It used to be oil. We used to rely on oil for so many things and, and still do, but apparently data is now more valuable and more important than that. And that gives you a really interesting insight into just how useful a skill it can be to manipulate data, to represent data, and to interpret data in making patterns. But today we have looked at all of those things and I've been really impressed with your confidence with lots of this. 
be really careful with those tricky worded questions. Make sure to break it down into different sections, find what it all means, and then work out what you need to do to reach the answer. From here though, log on to an uh, atom nucleus and complete that adaptive activity that's going to give you questions based on what we've learned and it's at a right level to challenge you. And would you believe it, the way that we find the right questions for you is by using data. Feel free to complete a quick questionnaire which will tell me the things I'm doing really well, the things that I can do better. What will that include? Qualitative data. You can stick around for a couple of minutes and Mila will be here to answer any questions that you may have. If you don't have access to Atom Nucleus yet, but you'd like to give it a go, you can have a free trial and you can speak to your parents about that. And that might also then mean you can come along to our Friday club quiz. But otherwise, really well done for all of your hard work today. It's been lots of fun. Have a great day and I'll speak to you all soon. Bye bye.